first I wanted just to set the context for this side event, especially since it is in that first slot. We're here to talk about resilience for the next three days. Resilience as a concept has gained a lot of traction, but there are still a lot of questions among the donor community, among practitioners, about what resilience is, about how it's different from development, and about how you measure it. And it's important that we get it right. One of the reasons resilience has gained so much traction is because of the increasing frequency and intensity of shocks and stressors that vulnerable households are facing. Those of us sitting at the table represent the Resilience Learning Consortium. And this group of organizations came together um, just over a year ago following a meeting that FAO and the WFP pulled together on measurement of resilience. And we came together around the idea of learning and knowledge sharing and sharing that not just among ourselves, but with the networks that each of us are also connected to so that we have that multiplier effect. The NGOs that are part of the Resilience Learning Consortium are operational on a global basis. We are focused on working with some of the most vulnerable households and we're interested in improving our own work. Um, so a lot of what we are focused on as the Resilience Learning Consortium is improving our own practice, but then also improving the practice and policy of others. Our format for today, we're going to use the fact that it's the early morning to shake it up a little bit. We're going to do a talk show format. There are a few questions that I'm going to pose to our panel for a mix of responses so that you'll hear from different individuals from different organizations um, throughout our discussion. We'll do that for about 50 minutes, and then we're actually going to have you break into four smaller groups. Um, I say smaller, the room is full, so they actually won't be all that small. Um, but we'll have you just break into smaller groups to talk about a particular issue that I'll raise once we get to that point. And then we'll come back together so that you can each share some of the, the points that came out of your small discussion, and we'll have one final question for our panel. So to introduce our panel. Um, immediately to my left is Mark Constas. Uh, Mark is the Associate Professor of Applied Economics and Management, and he's the Director of the Leadership Fellows Program at Cornell University. To his left is Christelle Boltman. She's the Deputy Regional Director for Program Quality in the West Africa region for CARE. Next is uh, Sean Ferris. He's the Senior Technical Advisor for Agriculture and Environment with Catholic Relief Services. To his left, we have Dr. Niba Baba Tierto, um, and he is the Director of Food Security and Climate Change in the East Africa region for World Vision. And then finally, we have John Kurtz, uh, who is the Director for Research and Learning with Mercy Corps. So without further ado, the first question I want to pose for our panelists really picks up on what is the title of our side event. What is different about resilience? Sean, I'll yeah. actually, yeah, if you want to you wanna take that question off. first. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, just like to kick this off with just a, a quick comment on, you know, uh, thinking about resilience in, in the, the sense that this is more of an approach. It's more of the how we do things now that, rather than the what we're actually doing. So we're really looking to see um, a number of different factors that we're working on. And this, the panel session in, in this first part of the, of the talk will just be picking on these different principles and ideas that are being changed as... Uh, as, as this sort of idea of resilience works through our programming. So picking on things like different ways of working through participation, looking at sort of self-reliance, co-investment ideas, different scales of operation, looking at time frames and those types of issues, looking at different investment processes. So we're going to touch on those types of ideas as we go through examples of how resilience is changing our programming. So with that, I'll pass it back to Christelle. Great. Yes, um, I think what's really different about resilience and resilience programming and resilience thinking is that we are anticipating and planning for shocks and stresses to happen instead of just ignoring and being overwhelmed when it actually happens, which means really proactively planning for that. Um, for this, we need to understand the risks that people are facing and we need those people also to understand the risks themselves so that we can help them to reduce those risks and be better prepared uh, when shocks and stresses, you know, uh, when they are facing shocks and stresses. Uh, so, yeah, so some of it, a lot of the shocks and stresses we are talking about are actually quite chronic. 
So uh, in addition to them coping with the shocks and stresses when they happen, we also need to help them to adapt to those, uh, those situations that are, that are really continuous actually, like climate change for example. Um, and when those, so, so it's all about really proactive and strategic planning in advance and as, uh, as Sean said, really with a larger uh, time, time frame in mind. Uh, so that when they happen, we can really help people to uh, quickly bounce back. Uh, and I personally don't really like this saying bounce back better, which we often say because I don't think it's very feasible. But at least for them to bounce back to, to that trajectory we are taking them on, which hopefully brings them out of poverty. So yeah, I think ultimately uh, resilience is the capacity of those people to stay on that trajectory in spite of the shocks and stresses that they are facing. So Christelle brought up the idea of, of resilience. What else do we need to think about when, we're, when we say resilience? I think to build on her point about the centrality of, of shocks and stressors, uh, for us, trying to understand what we're building resilience to is a fundamental question. And within that, uh, We've realized that lumping all types of shocks and stressors together really is not helpful in terms of distinguishing uh, programming entry points. So we realized that you know, depending on the shock, the strategies people rely on to be able to manage those are going to differ a, a lot. In our programming and research in Niger, for example, it came out really clearly that you know, in responding to the drought of 2009-2010, we were looking at market access as a, as a key factor or characteristic that allowed you know, rural families to be able to, to manage that drought well because they could buy food stocks, sell off livestock. Whereas it turned out in the, in the food price spike two years later, we're working similar populations, that it was more of the subsistence farmers and that as a livelihood where they were insulated from the market um, and relying on own, pro own production, that was the characteristic that, um, that needed more support. So it very, again, very sort of uh, informative towards different strategies based on different types of shocks. Yeah, and, and so one of the things I think, because resilience is quite new, uh, we're also trying to take a step back and think about how do people, how do the you know communities themselves understand this idea of shocks and cycles and stresses, and and some of the research that we did in Niger was really looking at if we're looking at different segments within communities, what is their sense of these recurrent shocks, and what we found was that the richer people in the communities felt much more shocked than the poorer people, and the poorer people their kind of response to this was you know, these increasing shocks is just normal. It's just the normal way that life is now. And because of that, uh, you know, one of the concerns that we have is that if that becomes their new norm, are they actually developing plans to cope with these ideas or are they starting to spin into this sort of downward spiral? And another bit of research that we were doing also, you know, looking across a lot of projects over the last 10 years at CRS <coughs> is also looking at this idea of if we are, in, you know, bringing in new interventions into communities, what is the sort of stickiness of those ideas? And, and one of the things that really came through with that research was that um, in order for us to have ideas that really stay with the community, we have to have a much better understanding of behavioral change processes. And, and those ideas are really coming out of health and trickling through into the different <laughs> sectors. But I think really the, the sort of underlying theme with this was a much better understanding of how communities see stress and how they uh, start to cope with it, and how we can sort of respond and work with those communities to find better outcomes for them. So this idea then of, of repeated shocks, Sean, <coughs> you talked about how for a lot of communities, shocks, that's just becoming the norm for them. When households are facing repeated shocks year after year after year, and it's incredibly eroding their assets on an increasing basis, what does that mean if they're approaching that that point of no return, if, if they're approaching a point where resilience can't necessarily be built. Um, Bob, I wanted to check if, if World Vision has any insights on that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in the Ansokia Valley here in Ethiopia, uh, repeated shocks led to a complete erosion of the natural resources that they needed to develop their livelihoods. And it led to a point where there was a talk about actually relocating the people off the valley. One of the villagers found his way to uh, Addis Ababa and invited World Vision in. And when we got in there, we worked together with the communities, and it was very important to understand what was needed to be done, 
And it was very important to build the necessary partnerships with the communities and to get the right mix of project models that was needed to turn around and restore the natural resource base that was needed to build the, the livelihoods of the people. And today, as we talk, Ansokia Valley is far from different. It's very, very different from what it used to be before we got in there. But there are governance issues in resilience. It is very important that you partner with government because there are policy dimensions in, in, in resilience. And without partnering with government, without getting the governance right in resilience, there is no way you can move forward. And when we talk about governance, we're talking about both the national governance and the local governance, that we need to partner. And that was the experience that we got by partnering with governments and getting the governance right, we're able to restore the environment and restore the natural resource base for livelihoods to thrive once more. That's great, thanks. So you've each talked a little bit about what makes resilience different from the work that we've been doing for decades. The Resilience Learning Consortium is very focused on practical approaches. So I'm gonna ask, um, Bob, I'm actually gonna to stay with you and, and perhaps start with you about how World Vision is then changing the way you're implementing or designing programs in order to take resilience into account. Um, yes, we have moved away from um, what we used to call community development programs to now a more area development program approach. And an area would typically comprise of about 22 villages. So we are looking at scale and we are also looking at duration, so no more touch and go. We put in a lot of resources where it's supposed to be put in and all our community projects, our area development programs are designed by the communities, actually they are led by the communities and facilitated by World Vision and other partners. One of the key ingredients here that I want to stress here is scale, duration, and partnerships. What we did not get very right in the beginning was how to bring in strategic partnerships from both government and from the private sector. And that is what we have now got down and in our work in Somalia particularly, working with partnerships with other organizations, we are able to develop very, very innovative programs to bring about resilience. So that has, Ansokia has taught us a lot of lessons on how to bring scale and how to be very effective in our programming. 